Hello folks, I was in New Orleans last week and I had the pleasure of interviewing Laura Ruiz, the primary author on this paper, Large Language Models Are Not Zero-Shot Communicators. Now this is exploring the ability of language models to perform implicature, which I guess uh, from a machine learning audience point of view, you might think of as being some kind of extrapolation or, or even abstractive reasoning. There's an example of this that we can try. Esther asked, can you come to my party on Friday? And Juan responded, I've got to work, which means no. Yeah, part of the reason I wanted to do this quick intro is since this interview, OpenAI has released ChatGPT, which is pretty impressive, actually. So we can come in here and we can say something along the lines of, Esther asked, can you come to the party on Friday? Juan responded, I have to work. Does Juan can Juan come to party? It looks like it has failed. It says it's not possible to say whether Juan can come to the party or not because we don't have enough information. Juan may or may not be able to come to the party depending on his work schedule and other factors. Oh dear. Yeah, so this is an example of a failed implicature. But anyway, if we come over to uh, Laura's Twitter, she posted a little thread the other day saying that loads of people have been sending her implicatures, which they used as examples in the paper. And uh, apparently ChatGPT does understand some of them, which she's very happy about, but she wanted to write a short thread about it. So she said before they started writing the paper, she would try lots of implicatures that she came up with on DaVinci 2 in different wordings with moderate success. Some always solved and some half of the time depending on the wording, meaning random performance since the test is a binary, which is to say a yes or a no. That's why they decided to do a systematic test to figure out how good it actually was and how much it, depending, you know, how much it depended on the wording of the prompt. And a few months later, they had the answer that it was okay, but not close to humans. And okay means that on DaVinci 2 and 3, the performance of zero-shot implicature is roughly 70%. Most of the other models fail, even with few-shot in-context prompting. So anyway, she said that she gets that people are excited that ChatGPT is doing pragmatic inferences, but she felt the same with DaVinci 2. It's all anecdotal, she says but a more systematic test shows a significant gap with humans nonetheless, and it's the same for DaVinci 3 and presumably the same for ChatGPT. She says that once this implicature dataset gets solved, and she has no doubt that it will get solved relatively soon, since fine-tuning with human feedback helps a lot, they might have some baseline pragmatics in their models, and that's when it will get really exciting. She says that she's personally blown away by ChatGPT's capabilities, it's absolutely incredible at explaining things, compositional generalization of concepts, simulating a VM. I'm not sure what VM means. Coherence, creativity, writing essays, poems, and more. She said that the pragmatic language that they studied is part of a type of casual language that we use in conversation, that it might emerge from social interactions. She's personally thinking about why human feedback helps so much and whether interactivity and social pressures might help even more. Anyway, enjoy the interview. Hi. It's lovely to meet you. Nice to meet you too. So uh, I was speaking with um, Andrew Lampenham yesterday and he really highly recommended your paper. I looked it up, it's called Large Language Models Are Not Zero-Shot Communicators. And I also uh, recognize Stella Biderman and Sarah Hooker, of course. Uh, Sarah's an absolute legend. Now, um, you led in the paper by saying, humans interpret language using beliefs and prior knowledge about the world. For example, we intuitively understand the response, I wore gloves, to the question, did you leave fingerprints, as meaning no. So um, you call this um, uh, implicature, but I, I suppose I would think of it as some kind of um, extrapolation, uh, being able to kind of reuse knowledge that we have about the world in a different situation. But could you um, talk us through that paper? Okay. So yeah, thank you. That was a great introduction to the paper. Um, indeed, implicature is kind of the technical term that we use for uh, this example that you gave. Um, and indeed, extrapolation is a sensible way to describe this. Um, what we do in this paper is 
kind of show that large language models are not really good at, at this aspect of communication. And we think it's a very important aspect of communication. So the title says large language models are not zero shot communicators, right? So what we mean by that is um, to be a communicator, you have to infer the meaning of utterances, not only by their semantics, so not only by how words combine into some kind of meaning, but, but by interpreting the shared knowledge, our shared experience of the world. And that's what we look at it, uh, in this paper. And what we find is that large language models are pretty bad at this. Specifically, we um, group them into different groups. So we have base large language models like OPT and Bloom that are just trained on next word prediction. And we also have instructable models like Flanty5, T0 or uh, Da Vinci's, uh, the Da Vinci instructable models by OpenAI. And all models perform really bad, closer to random than to humans, but um, OpenAI's instructable models have much more, uh, much more promise. They're much better at it. Interesting. Okay, so um, now the the zero shot thing is is very interesting. So we take these models, and it's kind of like self supervised learning. We train them on loads of data on on the internet, and you're saying that zero shot is when we don't really give much information in the prompt. Okay. So there's a relationship between how big the model is and how much in context learning that that we give to the model in in the prompt. Yeah. That's true, yeah. The zero shot case that we tested is we give the model a short instruction saying like um, in the following exchange, someone gives a response uh, that has some meaning beyond the utterances. Um, it ha the meaning is yes or no, um, can you resolve this? And then we give a, an example um, and then we evaluate it on ways based on whether it can choose yes or no. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the zero shot case and humans, we don't give any instructions at all. We just said, um, resolve this to a yes or a no. Okay. So is it the case that large language models then zero shot almost irrespective of their size and irrespective of this human feedback alignment, they just don't perform very well at this implicature at all? The instructable models by OpenAI uh, gets a non-trivial performance. Okay. I think the models like OPT and Bloom um those kind of base models they really can't do this task very well at all they get 10 percent above random mm. um but open ai's models are yeah around 70 percent at zero shots interesting so um did you do some work looking at okay well let's try um some in context learning and does that does that improve the implicature definitely yeah, yeah. we like it's it's unclear, right, whether zero shots is a fair comparison to humans uh, for these models. Humans are primed in different ways, so we also wanted to try few shots uh, in context learning. Mm -hmm. And personally, I thought in this case, in context learning wouldn't help much because each implicature uh, requires a completely novel type of inference. But in fact, we show that uh, OpenAI's models is the only group of models that really uh, benefits from this a lot and they can get to up to 80% performance with roughly five examples, which, and afterwards more than five examples, it's kind of plateaus, um, but there's there still like a significant gap with, with humans, but it's, a, it's a, a great improvement. Yeah, that's fascinating. So can you give me an example of, mm. if we were doing some in-context learning, let's say with, with Da Vinci 2, um, what would that prompt look like? So if we, um, I don't exactly remember the wording of the of the prompts, but there would be something like the following are examples of the task, and then you get a bunch of implicatures that are already resolved to a yes or a no, and then you get the, in, the original instruct uh, prompt that says uh, resolve the following sentence to a yes or a no, hmm. and then you get the actual example. And these in-context examples are all taken from a development set. Okay, okay, so can you tell us a little bit about how this um, reinforcement learning for human preferences works on language models. So reinforcement learning for human preferences is a method to fine tune uh, uh, base large language models. So the base large language models are OPT and Bloom, for example, that's uh, part of the group. And they are just trying to next word prediction, right? But they are not really aligned. There's sort of this alignment problem where they, they are trained on next word prediction and that's not really what we are asking them to do. Um, and then with reinforcement learning from human feedback, what we further do, we I mean, not we, unfortunately, other people do is they take um, 
some kind of human preferences from somewhere. Like, for example, humans are shown prompts and completions by models, and they say this one is better than that one. This completion for the text for this prompt is better than that one. By that, we get a sort of uh, ranking by preference, and we can learn a reward model on those preferences um, with an interesting trick that was published in 2017. And um, through this reward model, we have sort of, we can bootstrap the preferences from humans into the uh, uh, base large language model by fine tuning them with regular RL on, these, uh, on this reward model. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, I was speaking with um, Srijan uh, Kumar, he, he won one of the outstanding um, paper awards at, at Neurips, and he's got this work on um, kind of, we want the models to be more anthropomorphic and we have these priors to help us understand the world. And he came up with a, a framework of kind of like importing uh, these priors from language encodings into, let's say, a discrete program uh, synthesis model. But um, I guess what I'm saying is that, that there's something really interesting going on within context learning. And it's almost like we're giving the model the priors to um, extrapolate or to do something useful in this particular situation. Yeah, yeah, that's a really interesting. I, I don't know the paper, I should check it out, but the way I view it, and my, my uh, thinking has been shaped this week also by Andrew Lampinen, who wrote an interesting paper on comparing models and humans, is that it seems that in context learning for this specific task, implicatures, it's not really the, that they learn how to use their shared experience uh, from the in-context examples. They're primed for the task with a few shared examples in the context. And um, I think that's actually what's happening here. Like, mm. if you test a model zero shots, there's no, why would we expect it to, you know, do this task properly? There's no motivation or anything like that. But if you prime it with in-context examples, it, uh, it do, does better. And that's, that would also explain why it doesn't uh, help to add more than five examples, because it's not using sort of the inherent information in the examples. It's just being primed for this specific task. Yeah, that's really interesting. Sarah has done lots of work on interpretability in, in machine learning models. And um, one thing that I wrestle with a lot is whether we should try and get models to think the way humans do. And you can come at it from an intelligibility and interpret, you know, like an interpretability point of view, but you could also come at it from a generalization point of view. Like maybe we do symbolic generalization over cognitive priors and that's how we understand the world. But yeah. um, there are people who just say large language models, they're just a different mode of understanding and we shouldn't try and make them like us. Like what, what yeah. do you think? Um, it's a good question. I, I am really a non-expert on interpretability. I'm like, I always come at it from a very anthrop anthropocentric view. Like I would love them to be more like humans because that would make them interesting subjects to study also and uh, better to communicate with. But at the same time, you can take this opposite view. And I think Stella, uh, the co-author co on this paper often says like, you're making a category area, you're attributing something to these models that they cannot, they don't have knowledge, you know, like those kind of things. So it might also very well be that we're trying to uh, look for pragmatics or semantic understanding in these models, but that's just not how you should think about it. And I completely forgot to ask you, so, so again, um, just some, some of the audience don't know about uh, natural language understanding and linguistics right. and so on. So um, what is pragmatics? Yeah, that's a good question. So. Pragmatics is the the aspect of uh, is an aspect of language, uh, the way we study language, that doesn't really look at the syntax, so how uh, or semantics, um, which look at, for example, the, those kind of aspects of uh, linguistics, look at how what a word means and how you combine them into novel meaning. So those kind of areas of linguistics really look at when someone understands the term. Uh, the utterance says John loves Mary, they also understand the utterance Mary loves John. Pragmatics yeah. goes beyond that. It looks at how context and our shared experience really um, influences meaning. So usually the meaning uh, determined by pragmatic inference is not really directly part of the, the mm -hmm. context window. You really have to, um, you know, tap into your prior knowledge. Oh, that's an, yeah, so I'm, I'm a fan of, of Montague as well. So it's almost like we have the semantic potential and then we have pragmatics and that's bringing like some, some additional context. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah.
Okay. And because um, that was a really great example from, you know, like uh, that, that extrapolative example from Montego about Mary loves John. Mm -hmm. um, how could a large language model realistically, because I think of that as being a symbolic generalization. Yeah. So how could a language model do that kind of generalization? Symbolic generalization? Yes. Oh, that's a big one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I really, really don't know. Like I, I, in my research uh, journey, I can kind of come from studying compositionality and language, which is really more uh, this type of thing that we're talking about now and looking at more sort of uh, neurosymbolic approaches or, or stronger inductive biases. And now, you know, these large language models really showed us that there is an insane amount of uh, compositional generalization going on mm. without any inductive bias for that. Yeah. Uh, ChatGPT kind of shows us that with all these examples on Twitter, right? So you give it two novel concepts and um, it combines it beautifully into some kind of story. Um, but yeah, to go back to your question, how, how can they do it? I don't know, maybe skill will get us there to the, ex to the sense that humans are also imperfect symbolic reasoners. Like, again, to mention Andrew Lampinen, he did a great paper on symbolic behavior, yeah, yeah. where it's not really a, a discrete, I can do symbolic processing versus I cannot do symbolic processing, but it's more a, a scale. Yeah. Um, that's kind of shaped my thinking as well. I think it's a scale. Large language models are pretty far on that scale. They can do very interesting compositional generalization and sort of symbolic behavior, but they fail in uh, catastrophic ways as well. Like. Again, an example that I think comes from Gary Marcus is when you ask Chat, Chat GPT, um, does a, uh, how, does hor how do horses ride cowboys? And it just writes a whole story about, you know, how a horse rides a cowboy, even though it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, it's so interesting because um, I think it's easy to think of large language models in the binary. So uh, Marcus says they're bloviators. And um, and uh, Bender says they're stochastic parrots, and, and yeah. then you and then you have the folks who think that it's it's emergent, um, you know, reasoning and symbolic generalization. Yeah. And I was a skeptic, and I just can't ignore the evidence. They they Same. really are they really are doing amazing things now. Yeah. Um. And and you were just speaking to Lampen, and, and it's a similar thing with this idea of of you know like um, symbolic generalization. It might not be a binary, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It might be a very great competency. Yeah. Yeah. And humans also fail in certain cases. So on this in context learning, because that's something that, that has interested me. So um, the first version of GPT-3, zero shot, we didn't really know how to prompt it. It looked like a bloviator. Yeah. We then went on this intellectual journey and we discovered prompt engineering, scratch pad, chain of thought reasoning. Uh, I spoke with uh, Hattie Zo the other day and she's got this kind of like algorithmic prompt in context learning. Mm -hmm. and. It's just remarkable what's going on there. So, do, like, do you have any intuition? Is is it is it like the prompt is some kind of a program interpreter or something? Mm, my intuition is rather that the prompt kind of, I don't know how to formalize this intuition, but I guess that's why it's an intuition. Um, that the prompt kind of uh, primes the model and puts it into a sort of area of its weight space where it hmm. can. Uh, where it can, um, you know, better answer the actual question that is asked in, uh, in yeah, the actual question that's asked. Mm -hmm. And I think certain things that point towards this is that there is also uh, some research coming out where they permute the 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 labels in the in the in context examples, and they show that the performance is similarly good, even though at the same or like they do completely random labels in the in context examples and the performance is still pretty good. Mm. But there's also other work that shows that that um, doesn't always work. Sometimes you do need actual labels. Um, so yeah, again, <laughs> the answer is basically, I don't know, but my intuition is rather that the model is really primed for, uh, um, yeah. Or there's also another great way of viewing this. Um, and I read that on Less Wrong at some point, but I, I don't know how to attribute the author, but because I forgot their name, but uh, it's about, um, that these models are good at simulating anything. So you have to sort of prime them to know, let them know what they're simulating right now. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? Because um, we, we um, have an anthropocentric view of the world and we have, um, you know, we, we're agentive, we're, we're individual agents. Yeah. And a language model is, is everything at once. 
it's, yeah. it's almost like you need to give it a, a trajectory just just to just to get it to go somewhere interesting. Yeah. So um, with with this in mind, so, so you know, we we really want to make progress in natural language understanding. And what do you think are the steps we need to make to you know robustify these language models? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, personally. From this pragmatics paper, I think pragmatics is one area where they can make huge strides still. I think even though they have semantic failure modes, they are really impressive at that. They are really impressive at compositional generalization. Um, but pragmatics might be something that they are simply not you know, trained for uh, currently. And one very low-hanging fruit is the RLHF that we talked about. Um, I think that clearly really improves that it. And um, intuitively, it seems like these um, in the InstructGPT paper, you see that they ask the human labelers to really infer the human intent in the prompts and write on, and that's very uh, reminiscent of implicatures. Um, but then on a more sort of broader scale, I think some kind of embodiment or interactivity might be really important. Like pragmatic inference is really a social skill that we have. Um, there's a lot, of pragmatic, a lot of pragmatic pressures that you encounter while just acting in the world and navigating communication and navigating a lot of things. So I think I'm currently trying to look at uh, a setup uh, in reinforcement learning where we are trying to do a, make a pragmatic task and see when pragmatic reasoning would emerge there. And I, and I, um, yeah, I don't know how to consolidate that fully with large language models yet, but I think interactivity and uh, social um, navigation is yeah. uh, important. I'm I'm really fascinated by um, you know the the embedded tradition in cognitive science, and think there's a lot of interesting work there. But um, I, I suspect you do as well a little bit. How do you contrast, you know, what is essentially the representationalist view where everything's in this big monolithic model to some kind of relational view where we, we're using essentially the world as its own representation? Yeah. Yeah. Again, here, I don't know to what extent it's also possible to express everything in just a rep representationalist view where you have an internal world model. And, and I don't know to what extent you really need an external world to learn, but it's intuitively, it seems like that might be very important. And, uh, Intuitively, it also seems like the the, interest, the behaviors that can emerge are really limited by the world's uh, models acting in. So a large language model only sees text, um, and there's basic things it just simply cannot uh, learn, even though it has surprised us um, a lot. So I think, I don't know, it's easy to think about it in that it's really important to have some kind of external world to interact with, and um, but you know, I, I'm, I'm happy people are working on scaling and I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, some type of AGI, whatever that means, might not emerge from simply scaling up basically what we're doing right now. Amazing. And um, are, are there any other, um, you know, parts of your paper that we haven't spoken about? Um, yeah, one thing that we found pretty interesting is that even though all these uh, open AI's models can get uh, really high performance, close to humans, 6% roughly. That won't tell you much without like the details, but it's a significant gap still, but it's really, really close. I don't know if uh, a human might uh, figure out whether this model is a model or a human, you know, in that case. But when we sort of drill down and, and uh, uh, make a taxonomy of the examples that are in this data set, we um, find that they are mostly benefiting from the simple examples. Um, where not a lot of context is needing. So one example is um, an implicature is if you ask me uh, how many people came to your party and then I say some people came. Mm -hmm. It's really the conventional meaning kind of of the word some that I meant not all people came, mm -hmm. but it's still an implicature, but it's a, it's a very common one. Mm -hmm. So those kind of examples, if we isolate those and we look at specifically examples that are really context dependent, like... Um, um, are you coming to uh, the open air party tonight? I have food poisoning. You know, those need much more context to be resolved. And then the performance decreases again, and there is roughly a 9% gap, um, which like the best model, but all other base models and instructable models like Flan C5 and stuff, they, they then again completely fail on those kind of examples. Fascinating. I'm, I'm really interested by this idea that understanding is a complex phenomenon. 
And we, um, it's like the parable of the blind man and the elephant. So we, we create all of these metrics and the metrics exclude most of the truth. Yeah. And the metrics for pragmatics presumably are in some sense even more complicated than the metrics that we already use in natural language understanding. And yeah. um, it just feels like, is that, is that going to be a, a serious problem for us to kind of encapsulate how well the model understands? Do you mean that we're sort of um, giving it a test that it couldn't really solve? Well, I, I suppose one, one way of looking at it is in this particular test, we've come up with lots of examples of, of pragmatic inference, if you like. Yeah. And what we're doing is we're taking a very complex phenomenon and we're kind of, we're, we're putting pins through it. So we're putting like little slices through it in different angles. And, and then we've got this uh, shortcut problem that if we optimize on any one of those slices, we might be kind of like excluding everything else that's important. Yeah. So it feels like we've got, I, I mean, is is this like a, gen, a general problem in, in natural language understanding? It seems like you're getting at evaluation at, in some, to some extent, right? Yeah, like, yeah. I think evaluation is the single most difficult thing in NLP. To, uh, this is just a benchmark to give us some intuition as to what these failure model, current failure models, failure modes of these models might be. And I think if this benchmark is at some point passed by a model that's, you know, in and of itself, without trying to diminish my own paper, it doesn't tell us much. Like there's much more to be done. We need more different benchmarks. We need like human testing in a sort of Turing style maybe. Um, and yeah, I think I think this is the, the most interesting problem um, in NLP, like how to properly evaluate. Uh, interesting. Yeah. And do you take an interest in um, like fairness and bias in, in the models as well? I'm very interested in it, but from a sort of spectator view as well. Okay. Like I, I haven't worked on it at, at all. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Because that, that's presumably a, a massive challenge. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Yeah. Amazing. Um. So. Um. In. 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 That final question. Like, what are you most excited about? You know, in in your research trajectory over the next year or so. Um. Well, definitely, I just feel super excited to be working on stuff like this currently given the uh, capabilities these models show, like they're, they're absolutely amazing. And I love seeing how people interact with them. Like the creativity of people is really needed to get some kind of interesting response out of these models, right? And also the creativity of people is needed to find the failure modes. And um, yeah, so what I'm most interested in, uh, um, excited about now personally for my own research journey is really trying to look at, uh, you know, um, interactive setup and see when uh, pragmatic inferences might emerge in what kind of um, environments, in what kind of pressures do we need and, and how can we translate that back to getting to be, to getting like um, language models be zero shots communicators. <laughs> Amazing. And where can people find out more about you? Um, they can follow me on Twitter. It's first name, last name. And I have a website, uh, also first name, last name .com. Yep. Amazing. Laura, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you for having me. Amazing. Amazing. Right. Cool.